Welcome to a Celtic State of Mind. I'm Paul John Dykes and today I am delighted to be joined by Kevin Graham for yet another instalment of his feature podcast, Screamer Celica. Welcome back, Kevin. How are you doing? Not too bad, Paul. How's yourself? I'm very well dealing with the, the lockdown productively, as productively as I possibly can be by getting the podcast out on a daily basis, Kevin, and really enjoying the feature pods from the likes of yourself, Alan, who does the Celtic by numbers, Colin, who's doing the cult Celtic team, Declan, who's doing the, the treble, treble diary. It, it's actually really enjoyable to have these installments from you. So, Scream Celica, I love this feature. This is where Kevin Graham chooses an album that was inspirational to him, something that perhaps he grew up listening to. And he looks at the times around about that album coming out. And he also looks at what Celtic were doing at the time that the album came out. So, Kevin... This week, what is the album? Take us back. The album was released on the 2nd of February 1998 and it's Unfinished Monkey Business by the King Monkey himself, Ian Brown. Fairly obvious for folk that listen to this podcast eh, and know my taste in music. Obviously, Unfinished Monkey Business was Ian Brown's first solo album and it's a kind of lo-fi bedroom record. It seems to have been a kickback against the excess of The Second Coming with Bay the Roses. It's all over the shop musically, but it's got a kind of... It's got a swagger, it's got a groove, it's got attitude. The lyrics are biting eh, and, and very, very smart. It's the sound of a record, I reckon, of a man who's enjoying making music again and is in love with music again. It's one, one of those albums where... When it came out at the time, it, it does jump all about the place. But when you go back and listen to it, a bit like uh, a couple of weeks ago when I went back and listened to Doves, uh, Lost Souls, uh, it's an album where some of the songs that I thought would stand the test of time now don't. And there's other songs at the time which I thought were weaker, which I now think are better. The, the one thing about the solo album actually is, I think it lays the, the blueprint for everything Ian Brown's done solo since then. You can feel, you can hear in the songs, the 12 songs on Unfinished Monkey Business, bits of his solo career. And he's never really diverted from that, that path and truth. Eh? The hip-hop influence, the, the psychedelic shaman influence. It's his change of vocal delivery as well from The Roses, which I think took a lot of people be surprised mm -hmm. when the album came out. It's that sort of whispered, almost spoken word delivery. Yeah, I mean, you mentioned the hip-hop influences. What I would probably do when I'm looking at Ian Brown's debut album in 98, I would spring back four years, I'd go back to 1994, and three albums were quite pivotal in what was later to become Unfinished Monkey Business. The first one came out in the April of 1994, and it was Illmatic by Nas. And we know that Ian Brown was hugely influenced by Nas, and uh, so was A Celtic State of Mind, and we'll come back to that in a moment. But when you look at that album, in particular, there's a song which was released as a single by Nas called Half Time. It was recorded and released a couple of years before the album came out. But when you listen to that, the similarities behind the beat of Half Time and one of the Ian Brown singles from his debut album, Can't See Me, when you actually compare those two songs and the beat in particular, they're, they're strikingly similar. Now, people might counter that by saying, you know, the, the Can't See Me beat came from an old demo, an old Stone Roses demo where Rennie and Manny were jamming. And indeed, when you look at the actual credit for that song, Kevin, it does actually credit Rennie and Manny on it. But Rennie has since come out and said he never played on that. So it might have just been Ian Brown covering his tracks. And when you listen to Half Time by Naz, the similarities are brilliant, actually. I'm not, I'm not saying he's ripping them off. They're, they're very well used. Also on that particular album is a song called The World Is Yours, which was later to be the name of an Ian Brown album and there's another song on there called New York State of Mind or NY State of Mind which gave a Celtic State of Mind our name. So if anybody's ever been wondering why we're called the Celtic State of Mind as well as obviously the connotations behind it that was the inspiration. It was from the Nas album Illmatic. That was out in April. If you then go ahead to August and, and Oasis releasing Definitely Maybe 
for anybody who's watched Supersonic, the the documentary on on the band Oasis, uh, there's some brilliant tales, Kevin, about them meeting up with the Roses, who were also around about that time recording Second Coming, and how obviously they shared some time in the studio together. And uh, anyone who's been on Axom.net and read my interview with Paul Gallagher, I put it to him, you know, whether or not... Uh, Oasis took the wind out of the sails of of the Roses, and he, he wasn't having that. He kind of polarised both bands, but obviously, when everybody's sitting waiting on a, a new Roses album coming out, as I'm sure you were, Kevin, and many like us, Oasis came along and kind of grabbed the baton and just went and running with it. You know, I think No Gallica said that the Roses opened the door, but Oasis nailed it to the wall, kind of thing. So I think the the definitely maybe album was was huge in that respect because then when the Roses came out in, in December of ninety four, it came out to a lukewarm reception. I'm a big fan of Second Coming, Kevin. What's your take on the second album? I love the Second Coming, I've, and I've loved it since uh, it came out. Knowing what we know about the music press and the way the music press worked, especially in that point where they had massive, massive influence, I think the fact that the Roses never played the game didn't help them, and the album was always going to get panned uh, when it came out. And I think over time, it's kind of grew to be an album where it's now okay to say that you like it. Um, for me, it was always an album that I would say that I liked anyway. But what you're talking about there, I mean, the, the Roses, that's well documented what happened to the Roses. And I maybe agree with uh, Paul Gallagher that I don't think Oasis stole the Roses' momentum. I think the Roses lost their own momentum and they would admit that themselves. Obviously, Oasis, aye, there's a, a Stone Roses influence in Oasis, but the Oasis don't sound like the Stone Roses. Absolutely uh, not. So, I maybe the door was opened, but I, I think, again, Oasis played the press. They had Alan McGee, who was great at playing the, the press, and you had the Roses, who were quite happy to wallow in their own mystique, mm -hmm. and the myth was sometimes greater than the truth. Maybe time did change for the Roses to come out with a setting coming with a sort of Led Zeppelin type influenced album where in 1994 everything was looking modish, everything was looking British. Yep. Um, so it was probably an album that was out of step and out of time mm -hmm. to what the music press were. Championing, that, yeah, champion yep. at that point, and it was never going to get looked at objectively. They, they were never going to look at it as objectively as on merit on that on the songs. They were always going to look at it. it took you five years to to make this. You have never gave us any interviews. You're still not giving us any interviews. I mean, they gave their first interview to the big issue. Like yep. that was the only interview that they gave uh -huh. for that whole album. Their video for Love Spreads was just um, going about with masks. They, yeah. they never played the they, they never played the game. And if you jump to ninety eight, I didn't want to mess up the timeline there. Eh? Ian Brown started playing the game in ninety eight when the album came out. He, he did. done quite he done he done quite a lot of interviews, and a lot of it was just stone or rubbish. He was talking right enough, but it was it was almost as if he had been freed for the shackles of the roses. He had been freed for, I didn't need to be this mystique anymore, I, I can be who I am. But Oasis and the Roses are two completely different bands, and I do think the setting coming was more just out of step with what was being championed. Yep, I think that's probably the better way to describe the Stone Roses coming into a landscape that had been engulfed by Britpop, Kevin. And Oasis, although wouldn't have wanted to be part of that. Any musical movement under that term, they were thrown into that by the music press, Britpop, along with various other bands. And then when the Stone Roses come back, you're right, they were out of step because they didn't come back with the, the crystalline pop songs that they had written on their first album uh, or even the, the kind of crossover tracks like Fool's Gold that uh, were released after the first album. They came back with a rock album and it was very dark there were some glorious moments on it. Ten Story Love Song remains a phenomenal song. Uplifting, melodic. You also had songs like How Do You Sleep. I love the acoustic songs, Your Star Will Shine and uh, also yeah. Tightrope. And there's actually, there's a, a Paul Schroeder version of that album kicking about. I think the tracks are on YouTube now. But you listen to Tears from the Paul Schroeder sessions mm -hmm. and, and it's a brilliant version, a completely different version. And... Um, there's an old demo of Good Times with a different chorus that's very quite uplifting. It's a melodic chorus. So 
that there's loads of elements of that album that I love. And I think the scene I always go back to is Shaun of the Dead, you know, when they're throwing the, the vinyl at the zombies. Uh-huh. <laughs> and he picks up the second coming and there's that moment where they're debating whether or not to throw it. And he goes, I, I like that album, you know. And I think that, that debate will continue. But I'm a huge fan. And a, a funny wee story about that album is John Squire. I remember reading an interview that Squire gave and he said that uh, he was thrilled to get contacted by Roy Keane's people or team or agent or whoever it may have been because Keane was doing a DVD and he wanted to use a Stone Roses song in it. So Squire said, use whatever you want. Squire's a season ticket holder at Old Trafford, has been for years, and uh, he couldn't wait. So he gets this, it was either a, an invite to the premiere or he gets a DVD through the door, he's watching it, and it was the, the hidden track, you know, the one that's called The Fawz, and it's got violins and all that carry on, people ripping paper up in front of the mic and all that, it's just a nonsense. So just, you know, in, in the true Roy Keane style, he picked out the worst possible bit of music and he put it on his DVD, but would you expect any less for Roy Keane? No, no, always a contrarian as our Roy. He always. certainly is, he certainly is. But that album itself, I mean, when you look at that, the only song that was a standalone Ian Brown song on the second coming was Straight to the Man. And I think it's probably one of the weakest songs on that album. Since we've moved from listening to vinyl and uh, CDs, etc., and everything seems to be through the headphones, Kevin, I've got a newfound enjoyment of that song, and I think it's Manny's Baseline. So if it's a song that you agree with me, it's probably one of the weaker songs on the album. When you listen to it, hone in on, on Manny's Baseline. It's tremendous all the way through. You know, it's worth I, it just for that baseline. I think it's out of place on the album, more than it being the, the, a weaker song on the album. And if it would have appeared on Unfinished Monkey Business, it would have made more sense. Well, this is going to take us up to the next part of the story, which will be 1996, August 96, whereby the Stone Roses play their final gig. And I say the Stone Roses, John Squire had left, Rennie had already left before him, and Ian Brown, Manny, Soldier Dawn. And to be fair to them, they actually had contractual obligations to do quite a few festivals, and one of them was the Reading Festival that turned out to be the last it's remembered for all the wrong reasons, Kevin. Ian Brown's vocals were not up to scratch. He's admitted that himself. But they did play a few new Stone Roses songs, and one of which ended up on Ian Brown's first solo album. Another one didn't, actually. High Time, which was quite a, a floaty Stone Roses song. There was a few others, actually, that they were writing at that time. And I did interview Aziz Ibrahim, who had replaced John Squire on guitar, and Robbie J. Maddox, who replaced Rennie on drums. I've got in-depth interviews with them that at some point I'll upload onto axom.net. Pure music interviews, nothing to do with Celtic. But they did speak about a few other songs that were never ever played or recorded, one of which I remember being called Black Sheep. So even though the Roses were in their final days, Ian Brown was already becoming a wee bit more productive, Kevin, and I think we really did see that when he started releasing solo album after solo album. But before his album came out, we obviously had John Squire's Strike, which was Do It Yourself by The Seahorses. Now, they were, at the time, hugely popular. I think that album sold over a million copies. What was your take on The Seahorses? I didn't like them. Again, it's maybe a case of just moving on, and I will probably go back and listen to the album, since you've brung it up. I can remember listening at the time, but I'd kind of moved on by that point. You're in full fire oasis mode at that point. And what Squire was doing, I mean, Love is the Law just sounds like what the world's waiting for. And I maybe just found it a bit bland and my, I wasn't really in that, that correct headspace. And the whole concept of the seahorses just kind of spooked me a wee bit. That a busker squire picks up on the street and mm-hmm. next thing you know, as you say, they're selling a million records. And at that time when the Seahorses Do It Yourself came out, there was a lot of rubbish kicking about, which was selling loads of records. Mm-hmm. There was a load of bands that were jumping on that bandwagon. When when did that come out? 97. Time, like, Seahorses was 97. 97. Yeah. By that time, that sort of Austin Powers British cheeky chappy I'm a Londoner type music was sort of burning out and you had a lot of what was it the press called the indie landfill you had a lot of guitar bands who were appearing and I've probably just shoved the seahorses in that sort of landfill maybe as well I'm trying to think back to a 21 year old self and I was probably more in Ian Brown's camp anyway so I was probably always going to dislike whatever John Squire released yeah, <laughs> just just because of uh, misguided prejudice 
of a situation that I knew nothing about. Well, I was going to bring that up because obviously you already said that Ian Brown was prolific in his kind of press that he did as a solo artist and also in his tours, he constantly toured. But I mean, 97, as well as the music that was being churned out, like you say, there were some brilliant albums came out and I'm sure at some point you will pick an album from 1997. We can go into some detail and some depth, but you've got things like Mogwai Young Team, You've got Radiator by the Super Furries, Vanishing Point by Primal Scream, OK Computer, Radiohead, Spiritualized, ladies and gentlemen. You've got loads of great albums that year. See, you've probably mentioned there the reason why I didn't listen to the Seahorses. There you you've go. Probably, yeah. You've probably listed ladies and gentlemen were floating in space. I mean, I, I, don't think I, I don't think I listen to anything else apart for that and Vanishing Point for about six months. Mm-hmm. So that's probably one of the reasons that I was probably in a different trip at that point and the seahorses just didn't date for me no no i can i can understand why the other album that we will come back to it may actually be the chosen featured album is mick head introducing the strands the magical world of the strands uh-huh. released in 97 and when music like that's coming out although we wanted a stone roses fix because obviously the demise of the band was was really quite heartbreaking for a lot of us the seahorses at that time probably didn't meet the expectations that we had i mean as I said, I loved what Squire did on Second Coming and, you know, there's loads and loads of guitar layers on Do It Yourself by the Seahorses. Tony Visconti produced it, he had worked with Bowie and various others, but there was just something missing and I think it was a bit of soul and I think that's what Ian Brown always gave the Stone Roses. And then you had the drum and bass of uh, Rennie and Manny and if you remove that from any band, Kevin, it's, it's going to tear the heart out of it, you know? Well, I think that's I, I think that's one of the reasons why the roses took off. Uh, they, needed, they needed Manny. Manny was the final piece of the jigsaw, and when you listen to obviously there's quite a lot of early demos of the, the, the roses. Eh, mm-hmm. as soon as Manny comes along, that the, there's that element of funk and soul just appears. Even yeah. though you can hear that Ren is a fantastic drummer, as soon as Manny gets in, into the gig, the the whole dynamic of the band changes and I think did Squire maybe try to go for a Stone Roses light way the seahorses maybe he did but by the time Ian Brown came around with Unfinished Monkey Business he he was his vision was clear that he, he really didn't want to do anything that sounded like the Stone Roses whatsoever and he did really paddle his own canoe and I think Unfinished bu- Monkey Business is proof of that it's proof of as I say, is in, in the sort of introduction, it's proof of a guy who was confident of the songs that he was releasing. Mm-hmm. They sounded the way that they wanted them to sound. And he didn't really, pardon the expression, he didn't really give a monkeys about what was expected of him. And he just, and it was a sound as if he was going, I'm putting this out, I'm going to take it to record companies and I'm going to see what happens. And you can tell that in the album. I mean, the album's really, really loose in places, and it could do with tightening up. You mentioned Ice Cold Cube. Mm-hmm. When I listened to that again over the last couple of days, the last couple of weeks, it could do with a minute or so shaved off it. It could do with a bit tightening up, but then I think that's what he was going for. I think he was going, this is going to be rambling, this is going to be loose, this is just going to be what I want it to be. I mean, there's some great, great songs on it. I always thought My Star was a great lost Stone Roses song. My Star was our first introduction to what Ian Brown, as a solo artist, was going to sound like. I mean, you mentioned there Ice Cold Cube. Going back to that Redden performance, I preferred the version they did at Redden. It was a completely different version of the song that they did at Redden. And it, it probably was one of the more looser experimental types on the album, which probably hasn't nailed what, what Brown was going for, or perhaps it did. But my star, and, and I've said this to you before, I always thought there was a, an element of Dear Prudence by the Beatles in there. When I listen to Dear Prudence, you can hear, and the White Album is my favourite Beatles album. And uh, when I heard that, that influence straight away, it got me interested, first and foremost. And then I seen the video and I thought the video was very stylish. I mean, here we've got Ian Brown coming back talking about space exploration. Some, I mean, some of the lyrics of, of the seahorses were very much almost like British seaside postcard style humour. A giant squid stole my wife and kid. That was what John Aye. Squire was writing. 
And then obviously you then started hearing, you know, about space exploration and uh, the US space programme and Ian Brown has actually got something to say. But then Mader Stone always had that political influence as well, eh? So the, a lot of the, the major big Stone Roses lyrics always had that wee nod, always had a wee political nod. Mm-hmm. So we, we Ian Brown to come back with very political views on whether it was Nazis, the US space programme, it didn't really surprise you, but how forceful he was did surprise you because he didn't really do that much press. And when he's appearing everywhere and he seems to be getting a bit short by interviewers and it is a bit surprising, but again, going back going back to the album, I mean, it starts with uh, the intro under the paving stones, the beach. Yes. And that is basically a pastiche of the start of the second coming. It's done with toys and church bells ringing and a toy guitar getting played very, very like Van Halen-like. And 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 it's just, you can tell that he's doing it with a smile on his face, I think. Going, if you're going to get this, you're going to get what I'm trying to do here. And to go into my star straight after it, as you say, it's an introduction to Ian Brown as a solo, a solo artist. And the first time you hear it, you go, wow. That's amazing. Yeah, and you do. it still sounds it still sounds amazing today. It hasn't aged a bit. It's a timeless classic pop song. And other songs on that album, like then you've got Corpses. Corpses is hasn't aged at all either. Another fantastic song. You've got you've got two bona fide classics on that album. At least. At least now you're going about you mentioned there, Kevin, about the Stone Roses political angle and I've written about Bye Bye Bad Man and the reason for the lemons being on the front of the Roses album and the French flag. But one of the, the working titles of Unfinished Monkey Business was actually Under the Paving Stones, The Beach. That's at one point what Ian Brown was going to call the album. And the reference is, it's going back to the, the French riots, the student riots. Aye. And what, what they used to do was the students would rip up the paving stones from the streets to throw at the police. And what they discovered was underneath the paving stones, there was, there was sand. So there was this, it was almost like the name, the Stone Roses, it's a contradiction. You've got the hard stone and then you've got the rose, right, which is a beautiful flower. And it's a bit like that with the concrete and then the sand. And the symbolism is that when they found the sand underneath, under the oppressive rules of civilization, lies freedom. So underneath the paving stones lies the beach. And this was a phrase that can actually be seen near the end of the Jean-Luc Godard 1968 Rolling Stones film, sympathy for the devil so everything Ian Brown does has got a real deep meaning about it and I think that's what I love about his lyrics I don't think John Squire had that with the seahorses and I don't think the setting coming obviously Squire wrote the majority of the lyrics and the for the setting coming and I, I think maybe the setting coming lyrically lacks Ian Brown's intelligence mm-hmm. at some points again even even as a lot of his, a lot of his later solo work as well he's still got that lyrical intelligence and even on his last album there Ripples he takes on some highbrow political targets with very very simple lyrics, very straight to the point lyrics, sometimes very nursery rhyme like, and he gets his point across. There's no many artists nowadays willing to take political pot shots at anybody. They like to play it safe, and I think that's a lot to do with these artists. Uh, a lot of people call these artists nostalgia artists. They, they maybe are, but they, I think they're willing to take risks now because they've got a fan base there and they don't seem to have a record company pushing them for hit singles. They know they know that an Ian Brown album will sell 100,000 copies, 120,000 copies, and the record company budget for that and are quite happy with that. Well, again, on the, the note of political musicians, one of the best examples, I think, of Ian Brown's career was when he did the he did the duet with Sinead O'Connor. Illegal Attacks, mm-hmm. listen to the lyrics now, and that was released in 2007, it's re- as relevant now as it was back then, probably more so. But one final wee point you made about the, the introduction to Unfinished Monkey Business being a nod to the overblown guitar work of John Squire. Here's a thing for you. Have you ever seen the film Jerry Maguire, 1996 film, with Tom Cruise in it? Yes. There's a scene when Tom Cruise wakes up and he's walking along and he's, he's either hungover or he's tired and he stands on a, on like a kid's toy and the kid's toy makes his guitar sound, right? Oh. That, was, that was actually a toy and it was a toy that Ian Brown's kid also had. And if you listen to that song, 
and you watch Jenny Maguire, the same sound effect can be heard on both of them. Now, I'm not saying I was a Stone Roses obsessive or anything, Kevin, but I was pretty obsessed with them. But there's a wee interesting <laughs> fact for you, right? You mentioned Copsies. I think a massive part of Copsies, and an actual fact, my star, was a guitar work of Aziz Ibrahim. I mean, Copsies in Your Mouth was an astonishing piece of work. I mean, probably one of the finest songs Ian Brown's ever been involved in, and I, and I include the Stone Roses in that. What an incredible song that was. And again, lyrically, it was it was tremendous. I mean, there's a few references to Manny's girlfriend and everything in there. I don't know if you know the, the references. No, and that's I all didn't, no. that's all mentioned in the Copses in Your Mouths lyrics as well. But I mean, I'm looking through that. It's, it's a, a fairly patchy album. But what I was interested in was that Ian Brown had the opportunity to have Steve Albini produce it and he decided to produce it himself. Are you glad he did? Or would you have preferred somebody to come and polish it up a bit? No, no, no. I'm, I'm glad... Ian done it himself, I'm glad Ian done it his way, I think the album's all better for it, I think what Ian wanted to get over more than anything was his attitude, his vision and who Ian Brown really was and I think he he does it really really well in the album and he also used it to take some pot shots at a number of people in the music business and his ex, his old band, he also had a, used it to have a go at the British Empire as well, on Lions. Ah, it's a really, looking back, it's a really fun album, but it's easy to see why it never made any top tens or would never make anybody's top ten albums, truthfully, but it's it's good to go back and listen to. But saying that, if somebody says, Dave, what's, what's your favourite Ian Brown solo song? I think I would always say My Star, closely followed by Fear. Yeah. I mean, the three singles that came off of that first album were just brilliant singles. I mean, My Star, Can't See Me and Corpses were unbelievable standout tracks from the album. At that time, Ian Brown gave that interview to Joe Welly regarding the fact that the enemy wanted to bury him at Reading in 1996. The NME failed to choose Unfinished Monkey Business in the end of year top album poll top 50 but some of the albums in there Kevin I'll run through some of the albums as we do that you may or may not have bought at the time I certainly did uh, but something that never appears in the end of year lists is the Beat a Band of Three EPs because it's classed as a compilation album but um, I mean the Beat a Band I'm, I'm guessing you were a massive fan of, of that band as well Oh, definitely. I also think that maybe Unfinished Monkey Business was influenced a bit by the beta band, the way it's sort of lo-fi and stuck together. Obviously, we've been in this lockdown period and Kim Burgess has been doing his listening parties on Twitter. Mm -hmm. And the one on Saturday night was the beta band doing the three EPs. And I was quite disappointed to find out that they had re-recorded most of it after they got the money from the record company. Right. And so I was like, oh, I'm quite disappointed in that. I, I, I just pictured them in a squat in London doing mm. what they're doing, like they've done the Champion Versions EPs. It was also quite interesting to read that Steve Mason's never listened to the monolith until Saturday night, apart from when he recorded it. Is that so right? that, 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 aye. He, he says that the last time he listened to it was when they were, te- when they were listening to the test presence of the three EPs. Uh, uh, that was a fantastic album. I saw them in 98 and I'm sure my cousin will come back in and tell me exactly when in 98 we saw them and they were fantastic really unusual really quite psychedelic they were swapping instruments there was plants on stage there was weird backdrop weird film backdrops of them going up and down mountains in sleeping bags <laughs> um, it was really, really good. Another band that was another band that I would rate is one of the best ever Scottish bands. Truthfully, are the beat band, and again another band that sort of self destructed. But their legacy lives on. They're, they're a massive influence on a lot of people. Steve Mason's solo stuff has been consistently a high standard as well. He still plays Dry the Rain if you go to see him live, which is always nice. Um, I remember seeing that. I saw them at the Barrowlands. One Saturday night sold out. That was fantastic. Um, but I never went to their farewell tour. Um, I can't remember why I didn't go. I think they played the farewell tour was at the the academy. Mm-hmm. If I if I can remember right, I didn't like the academy, so maybe that was the reason that I didn't go. If you listen to the songs on that album, like she's the one, the house song, dry the rain, Doctor Baker. Fantastic In that period That should have been Album of the year But I know it was uh, Rated as a compl- Compilation album But it should have been Rated as a Compilation album It was fantastic 
It was, it was, and it had a real DIY feel about it. You mentioned two things there. First of all, obviously the, they're Scottish, and there was a few Scottish albums came out in this year, Kevin, that played a big part in my year, certainly. Bell and Sebastian, The Boy With The Arab Strap, an album that I still listen to regularly to this day. And uh, on the flip side of that, Arab Strap with Philophobia. And uh, I had the great pleasure of interviewing Malcolm Middleton. I need to dig that interview out as well. That was a right good laugh, talking about Falkirk FC, etc., we also had Idlewild with Hope is Important. I was an Idlewild fan for about three albums. And Boards of Canada, Music Has the Right to Children, which is a, an electronic band by a, top, a couple of guys from the Pentland Hills who were geniuses, musical geniuses, Kevin. And to this day, anything that they bring out, uh, they have a cult, they have the tribe, as you describe them. Uh, wherever they bring something out, the fans will buy it because... They're, they're, they're very niche, if you like, but you hear their music popping up all over the place, boards of Canada, don't you? What's really weird about all these Scottish albums that you've mentioned there, I never listened to any of them at the time, mm-hmm. and you're talking about it's only recently that I've listened to all those Scottish albums and got really into them, but they they, they bypassed me in 1998. Right. I, I think I was maybe a bit too worried about a, a certain team getting 10 in a row at that point. Or <laughs> we will uh, get maybe, to that. We will get to or, that. Or, or, or I was maybe just, I maybe just had a complex about Scottish bands. <laughs> I maybe just thought they were all shite or rubbish. And uh, especially a band for Falkirk. How can you be decent for Falkirk? Uh, that, that might have put me off. I don't know. I'm trying. I'm trying to put myself, place myself back in a in my early twenties head. <laughs> but I, I must admit, a lot of the albums that you have mentioned now are fantastic albums, especially the Boards of Canada one. And I would have heard the Boards of Canada one at the time, mm-hmm. and I probably flippantly says that is a load of rubbish. <laughs> I'm sure I probably did because it took me a wee while to appreciate electronic music which wasn't banging Chemical Brothers-esque Fat Boy Slum type I mean one of the albums I really loved that year was The, Lo- the Low Fidelity All-Stars How to Operate with a, a Blown Mind Yes um, I, I still listen to that, that that's, that's still a fantastic album and Agreed And Boards of Canada is a completely different end of the electronic spectrum Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. I do know that at some point, some early morning, late night, somebody's played me Boards of Canada and I have probably said it's rubbish <laughs> at that point. The beauty now of the te- technological advances since then, Kevin, is that nothing is beyond a retrospective review. So you can always go back and then appreciate it. And that that's the whole beauty of these things. I mean... You spoke about the lo-fis. I, I love that album, Vision and Incision in particular. I just love the whole, it was like a, going from the kind of DJ, there was a bit of mixing going in there, the lo- a lot of sampling, and, and the lead singer was called Wrecked Train. Now, talking mm-hmm. of strange names, Aidan Muffet of Arab Strap, he's got a little boy called Batman, and that's the truth. Now, talking about a kind of dance influence as well, you had Uncle with Science Fiction, outrageously good album, which obviously also resulted in a collaboration eventually with Ian Brown, whose Be There wasn't ready for the the album coming out, uh, but it later became a, a single, a standalone single, Be There, Uncle featuring Ian Brown, which is up there again with some of the Ian Brown's finest work, I would suggest. We also had Jurassic 5, we had Massive Attack with Mezzanine, Air, Moon Safari, which was a, at the time described as a coffee table CD. Don't know what that means, but it was a good album. And one of the best of them all, and I'm interested to see if you would agree with this, Mercury Rev with Deserter Songs. Uh, I love that Mercury Rev album as well. Goddess on a Highway. I, 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 it seems a bit obvious to pick that as a track, but it's just so wholesome and just so cuddly and just so warm and it, it feels like a decent deep south whiskey. The image that the that the lyrics conjure up is just fantastic. That's another sort of album. That, that, that that's not really a party album either. Eh? That's just a sort of that's sit on a, sit on a sofa. If you if you like to have a smoke and a, a good wine, that was one to just sit on your sofa and listen to. Eh? Oh, I really, I, I really did like that album. Oh, it was tremendous. And you know, it didn't surprise you really that the band were in a situation where they had to go away to the Catskill Mountains to record that. You know, there was a whole epic backdrop to them actually going away and disappearing from 
the rat racing from society and holing themselves up in kind of log cabins and, and writing probably their, their finest work, to be honest. I mean, it was one of the albums, Kevin, that prior to that, I had never heard of Mercury Rev, but you then backtrack, don't you? You go back and you start listening to their previous stuff. And um, since then, I've continued listening to their albums ever since. So it had a huge impact on me, one of my favourite albums of that particular year. But that year, you've already alluded to the fact that you know, you might have been concentrating on other things. Celtic had come up against a financially doped Rangers who had gone on to win nine league titles in a row. At the turn of the year, we started off by beating them 2 nothing in a, a memorable match where the two the two midfielders scored Lambert and Burley to win 2 nothing. That actually was Vim Janssen's one and only victory against Rangers. Never beat them other than that one game. But Celtic lost two games, both the Rangers won the league won in the Scottish Cup semi-final, as obviously we went and won the league on the, the last day of the season. Now, Kevin, you wrote a, an excellent piece on Axom.net this week, whereby you were talking about the Harold Bratback dilemma. Now, let's go back. Talk to me about your memories of Bratback, his arrival, the kind of stock that he had when he arrived because of his goals in the Champions League, and why it didn't really work for him. Or it did, and then it didn't, and then it did. He comes into a football club which is under a hell of a lot of pressure and he's got a decent pedigree but behind the scenes not all as well as blew up as soon as we won the league as was evident in the early early part of that year that Wim Janssen wasn't going to stay there were there was a lot of problems within the squad which was shown earlier on the next season when the bonus row with Croatia Zagreb comes up. There seemed to be a lot of big characters in that dressing room and it didn't seem... I think there was a a camaraderie in that dressing room but it was against those upstairs. There seemed to be a a them and us situation. Again, looking back and and when you talk to guys for that period as well, Tom Boyd, we said in that, the team seemed to get on but they didn't like who they were working for. Mm-hmm. Um, that's no, that's no, that's no saying Janssen and Murdo McLeod. It was me or Fergus and Jock Brown, Jock Brown. probably. Uh, yeah. and there seemed to be a lot of backstabbing going on. So he's coming into a difficult situation. He's coming into a team who haven't won a title in ten years. At this point, Henrik Larsson's not the Henrik Larsson that we that we know and love. Yeah, we could tell he was a decent footballer, but he wasn't a world class footballer that he turned out to be. At, at, at this point and he signed this guy who looks a bit slim he's got a decent goal scoring record but you really tiny do feet. believe that tiny, tiny feet tiny feet but you really do believe that he's he's a final bit of the jigsaw he's what you're waiting for he's that partner for Henrik and he's going to suit the way Wim Janssen plays it didn't quite work out like that and there's probably numerous reasons for that what everybody sort of remembers is he did he did have some horror misses he really did he sometimes touch let him down in front of goal but Jansen was a pragmatic manager and a lot of people forget that that it was probably the reason that we didn't want it earlier was because of Jansen and his natural instinct was to be cautious and I think the strikers towards the end of that season maybe paid for that. This is hindsight again. This is really hindsight. Uh, looking back on a, on a situation where you're trying to put yourself where you were in a really, really intense period just 20 years ago. It was an enjoyable period to be a Celtic fan. I, I hear folk that say when we won the league at that day in May, it's their greatest ever day supporting Celtic. And I can safely say it wasn't mine. I've said this a number of times on the podcast. My overriding feeling was one of relief that we had got this massive, massive stone off our back. Monkey off your back, Kevin. It's a monkey show. Come on. Got got this massive, massive monkey off her back. It was a king monkey, mate. It was a king uh, monkey on your back. Let me tell you. Definitely. And I think Harold paid for that. I mean, you have a look. He scored his first goal against Morton. Then he scored four goals against Kilmarnock. He scored a 25-yard scorcher against Dunfermline in the following game. He had a good run. I think he scored eight goals in nine games. Then he never scored again until that goal at one of the league. He never scored for a whole two months. He was dropped. He, he kept seem to last in 60 minutes. And Darren Jackson 
would come on for him. Now Jackson had just recovered from uh, water on the brain. Yeah. Um, and there's numerous reasons why it didn't work. Now, there's one thing that I've learned doing this podcast with yourself, Paul, is sometimes footballers just don't suit clubs, and sometimes footballers' careers take strange turns through no fault of their own, mm -hmm. and it doesn't mean they're bad footballers, and I think fans are quite quick to judge why things don't go right for certain players ah he was rubbish you didn't get to that level if you're rubbish you, no. you didn't score goals in the Champions League if you're, if you're rubbish you didn't score 94 goals in 100 games for Rosenberg if you're rubbish you didn't score 166 goals for Rosenberg over your whole career if you're rubbish no there's, no. there's, certain, there's certain circumstances where it just doesn't work as I put in the story that I wrote for it that season Harold Brackbart scored the goal that won us the league and he also scored the winning goal against Real Madrid who ended up that season Champions League winners that's, yeah. that's, two, that's two massive goals to score in your career Never mind in the same season. And he went on, Kevin, when he left. It's a great point you make because when he went and rejoined Rosenberg, he went on to continue to score in the Champions mm -hmm. League and obviously scored against Celtic on two occasions in the same game. So you're absolutely right. And there's other examples of that. Timu Puki being one of the most recent uh, examples uh -huh. of a player that just didn't fit with the club. And you do need to have that blend and there's so many different circumstances surrounding that. It could actually be the country that you're living in, whether or not you're settled off the pitch. It could be whether or not you, you've really immersed yourself in the actual team and you feel part of that team. It could be any number of reasons. But Bratback, as you rightly mentioned in the article that you, you wrote for the site, became a cult hero forever on the 9th of May 1998 when he scored that goal. And his image with Henrik Larson on his back with the tongue out pointing down at Bratback will be viewed forevermore it's now Bratback is now part of the Celtic fabric he's a player that Jim Moore wrote a play about and very very few Celtic players have had a play written about them specifically but Bratback's one of the guys he became a cult hero that day and over that period Kevin we've already explained some of the the tunes that were playing in our cars and and at home once we got back from the games but I, I do look back on the Vim Janssen years and and I've studied that season quite a bit, obviously, when we did a, a, quite a lot of the Smell the Glove events and interviewed a lot of the players. And one of the big things is we only had to go out and buy a striker because I keep saying this, we, we've stopped producing. Celtic have stopped producing goal scorers. When you think back, when was the last prolific player that came through the ranks? Charlie Nicholas. Since then, uh, we've had Jerry Craney, right, who showed promise and people will laugh, but he did show promise. He was prolific. And then obviously he fell out of favour and was sold. Burchill showed promise. He was called the Scottish Michael Owen at one point. Lost a yard of pace. We've never produced a goal scorer, Kevin. N no, you're right. And we've had a number of false starts. You mentioned Jerry Craney there. You mentioned Mark Burchill. Tony Watt. I mean, uh, everybody thought the, the world was Tony Watt's oyster when he scored that goal against Barcelona. I may remember the two goals he scored against Motherwell. When he yeah. came came off the bench, uh, came off the bench, but it's the pressure of being a centre forward at Celtic, and mm. it's the pressure of when you look, you look if you go back to ninety eight, then you maybe look at ninety nine. In ninety eight, the, the partnership was mainly Larson and Simon Donnelly, and you had Darren Jackson appearing later on in that season. But you, you signed Bratpack, who's an international Champions League quality player. The following season. You then bring in Mark Viduka, yeah. who again was another fantastic footballer. After that, there's there's numerous. It always seems. I wonder if it's the fans. Do we just crave big strikers and we don't give Scottish strikers the time to well, there's something, develop? There's something there, Kevin, because that's almost forty years since we produced a prolific goal scorer, and that really is shocking when you think about but it. The, but then you can actually say it's been 40 years, probably since Paul McStay. It's been that length of time, 40 years, 30 years, whatever it is, before Scotland's actually produced a couple of world-class footballers and Kieran Tierney and Andy Robertson. The Scottish game fell off a cliff in the 80s, the mid-80s, and you could probably pinpoint, for me, I can pinpoint it to Graham Souness coming into Scottish yeah. football. The and false revolution. The false revolution, mm -hmm. Kevin, of and, 1986. Yep. And 
the English club's been banned, Rangers signing all these great players at the time. Now, I mean, you, you can't argue with that. I mean, the, the English guys that came up here all came up here with a with a great pedigree. Whether there was envelopes involved in service stations, we can probably say maybe. But for that point, Scottish football's went downhill and the Scottish national team went downhill. And uh, as you say, it was a false revolution, definitely. And I think Celtic have struggled since then. Even even just now, you look at the bench this season, Stephen Welsh came on against Hamilton, had a great game against Hamilton. But then none of the fans, I know I never considered him to be an option to get many more games from now, from then to the end of the season. You look at Karamoko Dembele as well. He has... He's been on the bench a couple of times. I know that he was injured, but we would hope to see him next season whenever uh, that may start. But you have a look in Dembele's age group and who, how many will make it from Dembele's age group into the lucky. Celtic first team? You'd be lucky if one makes it. And I always go back to this. It was an interesting topic that I spoke to Neil Cameron about was the, the you know the false revolution of 1986 and how the the actual the Scottish game has suffered ever since then. But it, it's a it's probably a, a conversation we could have on a separate podcast. It's an interesting point. Celtic have not produced a striker in 37 years, a prolific goal scorer. So probably the closest that we've come, and I, I would be interested to see the stats. Who is the most prolific Celtic striker that's come through the ranks? Is it Jerry Craney? I mean, that, th- these are the things that would be very interesting to look at. And I know players like Sean Maloney would have scored a lot of goals, but he wasn't an out-and-out goal scorer, was he? And um, That was just more to do with the fact that he played a lot of games, I think, you know? I'd be missing James Forrest here. Forrest but, could be... But it, it, would he be described as a prolific striker? It's more of a no, striker, prob- I'm thinking, you know? Aye, probably not. He's no, chipped in. He chipped in with a lot of goals and obviously a lot of assists, but I'm thinking... I mean, what, what, I, what I worry about... What I worry about is the guy Jack Aitchison probably hasn't yeah. got a future with us. He, he went to Forest Green, started off well, seems to have fell off a cliff. But I have a look at the the, the strikers in Dembele's age group and occasionally you see them in uh, the Glasgow Cup when uh, when it's live on the telly and that. And I think we've got an American guy up front. And th- none of the strikers stand out. And in Dembele's age group, that there's rumours that a lot of the players are going to leave. They're going to go to Germany. They're going to go to England. And so they've been through the Celtic youth system up until nearly signing a professional contract. And they're going to leave. And there's there's about five of them, we think, well, I've been told, are going to leave Celtic in the summer or whenever they're allowed to leave. And they're going to move on to Chelsea, Man City, Bayern Munich. So that is worrying for Celtic as well, if that is happening. And they're spending all this money on the in Lennox Town on the residential schooling, and these players get to sixteen, don't sign a professional contract, and move on to move on to clubs that are offering more money. Yeah, they're just getting a schooling at Celtic. Now, Kevin, I've thoroughly enjoyed that uh, look back on nineteen ninety eight musically, and also through the prism of Celtic. That was Schema Celica. I look forward to your next album and your next walk down memory lane and I'll speak to you then. Thank you very much. Speak to you all later.